dead? Yeah. I'm not really sure I understand what Jesus is talking about. What do you mean? You know, the stories he told. What do they mean? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, Jesus. <laughs> he uh, told us a lot about the kingdom of heaven and, and what it's like. <clears throat> it's like... <clears throat> it's like a guy who left home and now he has to go eat with the pigs. Remember that guy? It's like lighting a candle and putting a basket over it. You know, it's like a yard with buried treasure in it. It's like a fishing net, essentially. Um, or like a tree with no fig newtons on it. It's like selling everything you have to buy a giant pearl. It's kind of like this salt. Yep. Salt. Like, you know, you're sweeping and cleaning, you're cleaning, and you find money on the floor. You don't really understand, do you? Not, not really. I feel like you're just playing mind games with me. That's fair. Yeah. Wedding reception. Yes, that's what it is. I'll just ask Mom. start today with an apology because um, some of you are just rolling in here watching online minding your own business just going to do the church thing and I'm about to cause a bunch of problems all right just so you know it's really not my fault we're going to blame the Holy Spirit and the Word of God but uh, we're going to look at a topic that tends to get people a little worked up and we're going to do it by looking at a parable and what is worse I'm not actually going to explain the parable because one, it's a really hard parable to understand. And two, the point of this parable is not to understand the parable, but instead to understand what's going on inside of us based on this topic that we're in. So we're in this series called My Games, where we're asking the question, why did Jesus speak in parables? Why didn't he just come straight out and say it? The disciples asked him and said, why do you speak in parables? Why don't you just explain what you mean, make it really clear? Why are you telling these little stories? Because here's the thing. I hope if you're doing the readings and the devotions, I know several of you are, because you keep calling me or texting me or reaching out to me and say, what does this mean? And then I say, what do you think it means? And you're all mad at me about that. So, um, so, so the point of parable is not a cute little story to illustrate. It's actually a profound conversation that's meant to confuse and unhinge and unsettle in such a way that we bring the topic to our inner life, and we're not so much concerned about understanding the Bible outside of ourselves so we can just forget about it. We're trying to understand what's going on inside of our soul, inside of ourself, and this topic is a big topic. So this is what Jesus said. He said, for this people, and by this people, he means us. Okay, let's just assume that we're equally in need of this as the people who lived in Jesus' day. For this people's heart has grown dull. We've gotten used to things. We've gotten familiar with things. We've gotten okay with things we should not get okay with. And, and so we've grown dull. And their eyes are bare, uh, can, uh, with, and with their uh, ears, they can barely hear. With their eyes, they have closed them. Notice that it didn't say they were closed. They closed them. There's just some things we don't want to look at. Parables make us look at them. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and this is all that Jesus is trying to do, get us to turn, okay, because remember, in the parables, he's hidden the secrets to the kingdom of God, turn, repent, get on track, and I would heal them. And so there is a healing in these parables. Now, the topic we're going to be looking at today is one that I just believe that we are routinely, regularly in need of deep healing about, and it's the topic, actually, that Jesus talked about more than any other topic in all of his parables, and it has to do with money. It has to do with wealth. It has to do with stuff. And here's the deal. If you have not thought about this for a while, if you have not prayed about this, if you have not taken this topic to your inner life, sat down at your spiritual imaginary you know, uh, table with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father and unpacked where you're at with wealth, then you're probably off. Because we as Americans tend to be off at this topic. We tend to have in America an Americanized Jesus rather than a crucified Jesus. We tend to have a, a, a Jesus that emphasizes, you know, prosperity and me getting stuff rather than things like sacrifice and 
compassion. We, we tend to get our sense of identity from our stuff rather than getting our identity as children of God. And so Jesus brings this topic up a lot. And why is he doing this? Is because he's telling us parables. And, and if you take time to notice how many of the parables have to do with wealth, have to do with power structures based on wealth, all that stuff. Parables are not meant to simplify and make things clear. They are meant to slow us down. And so this is an opportunity for us to slow down on this topic, cause us to ask questions. How am I doing in this area? And to let go of certainty. Or we might say this week, self-justification. The idea that, you know what, that's not a problem that I have. Um, Jesus warned about this. In fact, the Bible has so many warnings about it. It actually tells pastors, warn those who are rich not to be certain of, of earthly gain and instead to be rich in good deed. It, it tells us that, that, that very few wealthy or rich can enter the kingdom of God. It's harder for, for the camel to go through an eye of the needle. He, he, he tells us over and over again, don't take comfort. The Psalms are full of warnings about the person who put their trust in wealth and status and structure. Jesus said over and over again, you know, uh, don't, don't think that, that the person, who, the, he says the people who trust in this, this earth, it's like, it's like hay, wood, and stubble. It all burns up. But, but the things that are really important, those are the true gold, the true silver, the true things that endure and they have nothing to do with material wealth. And so, so this is a topic that regularly and routinely we got to slow down, bring to the inner place, and just ask Jesus how we're doing this. Again, central to this teaching is just going to be some humility. So truly, because this message messed with me this week, doggone it, um, just in that spirit, let me just, 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 just give you a little confession, okay? There have been times in my life and not so far away, where I got my security and comfort from my wealth. There have been times in my life where I spent money, not because I needed something or because I should, but because I wanted to get comfort or status or wanted to look a certain way. This is particularly a problem in the fishing store. There are times I have put money above relationships. There have been times I've used my wealth to intimidate, control, and manipulate people. There have been times I've been judgmental towards the poor and rationalized not helping them because, after all, it's their fault they're poor. There are times that, that, that I have been dishonest in my desire to gain wealth. There are times when I have loved money and it drives God out of my life. So, so I just want to say that if you're not at the point where you want to have kind of that kind of humility, that you don't understand that this is always creeping on us, okay, then then you're going to have a terrible morning. So let's just take a look at this, the, 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 the scripture. This is about being shrewd. Now, again, there is probably, there are very few parables that you read them and you're like, that just, that just doesn't make sense. Or that can't be what Jesus is saying. Or you're just going to want to disagree with Jesus, but him being Jesus and all, you can't do that. This is a strange parable. And again, it's not meant to be something, oh, I understand completely what's going on. Let me explain it. This is how you should apply it. This is the thing. This is exactly it. Here are the four principles. Thank you for coming. Instead, it's supposed to trouble us so we go then to our inner place, our inner life, and say, okay, how am I doing on this topic? So let's go ahead and take a look at this parable. So this is it. Jesus told his disciples, there once was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possession. So here's what you've got. You've got a rich man, and, and we're going to want to make the rich man the hero. It's hard to do in this story. And, and then you've got the other guy who's accused of, of wasting the guy's possessions. And here's the thing about it, is that there's nothing that redemptive about this guy. And yet Jesus is going to point out an action that this immoral person takes as something that we should say, oh, I need to be more like that. And Jesus loves to do this. He, he finds, uh, tells a parable about an unjust judge or about a rebellious son, or in this case, about, about an, uh, uh, an unethical employee. And so what's happening is this, this uh, guy's found out, his guy's mismanaging his funds, there's an accusation been made. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Now immediately you're going to notice, or maybe you're not immediately, but you should notice that the guy doesn't say, oh, it's not true, I can show you. Everything in this parable is telling us that this manager was mismanaging something, listen now, that doesn't belong to him. 
Okay, let me just say that again. Mismanaging something that doesn't belong with him. You see, the, the, the employee, the manager, was not an owner He was a steward. He was entrusted with something that belonged to someone else, and he mismanaged it. He took advantage of it. He wasted it. He squandered it. And and this is the central issue that we have got to start and start with, live in, and run back to all the time as followers of Jesus Christ when it comes to possessions, wealth. We are not owners, I can't say that strong enough. You need to remind our heart. We don't own our time. We don't own our life. We don't own our possessions. It belongs to someone else. It belongs to God. And he has entrusted us to use those things in such a way that brings him fame, that blesses him, that when you sit down with him in that inner life and say, how am I doing? He says, this is how I want you to do it. I mean, you're taking care of your family, you're meeting responsibilities, you're helping out in ways that you're supposed to help out, you're, you're helping for the poor, it's not becoming too important, it's not sh- becoming your identity. This is an issue of stewardship, and there's a story of a guy who's not been a very good steward. So, look what happens, really strange story. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. And so he's thinking, I said, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna lose everything. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg, okay? So again, not a great guy, okay? I'm too good for this, uh, and pride and shame is all mixed up in there. He says this, I know what I'll do. He says, it's, it, in the Greek, it's, he had an epiphany, I'll do. So that when I lose my job, look at there, look at this. Here, people will welcome me into their homes. He says, I gotta, I gotta make a plan to take care of myself. And so he starts making this plan. This is what he does. So he calls in each one of the master's debtors. So he gets all the people who owe his master money who he's supposed to manage. And he asks them the first, how much do you owe my master? He says, 800 gallons of olive oil. That's just a lot of olive oil. He replied, the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. So he forgave him half the bill. Now what this is gonna do is the guy say, okay, awesome. Half my debt just went away. And so he's going to ingratiate himself to the person. So listen, he's going to use the wealth to make friends. Okay, watch this. He doesn't stop there. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So another guy, yahoo, just leaves awesome happy, okay? And then verse eight, the master commended the dishonest manager. This is where it gets weird, okay? Because you would have expected to say, the master said, what are you doing giving my stuff away? What are you doing uh, 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 forgiving debts that aren't yours? Your, your actions are unethical. Your actions are, are self self protecting. See, this is the part of the parable we start saying, Jesus, you sure this is the story you want to tell? Because it doesn't sound like the way it's supposed to be. The master commended the dishonest manager. Why? Because he acted shrewdly. Now, this word shrewdly is a really interesting word. It's not a word that has a moral connotation to it. So to be shrewd doesn't mean you're bad or you're, you're yucky. Now, this guy was bad and he was kind of yucky. But that doesn't necessarily what shrewd means. Shrewd doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're, you're good or you're noble. What shrewd basically means is he acted with insight. He acted with insight that, that led him to perceive what was going on, and he made a plan, and he was just smart about it. And, and so, so he, he said, you know what? <laughs> that was smart. That was shrewd. That, that was a person who thought through what they wanted to do, and they executed doing it. So that's what's being commended here. For the people, look at this, of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light. So basically what he's saying is that the manager, who apparently wasn't an upstart guy, and the owner, who apparently wasn't real into rules and morals and that kind of thing like that, he said, they know their business. They know what they're trying to do better than children of the light. Children who are followers of God. That is to say, they're just unapologetically figuring out, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to survive. This is how we're going to make money. This is how I'm going to find people who will take care of me after um, I don't have this job anymore. So they figured out. He said, they're more shrewd. They have more insight. They are more discerning than people of the light. Because here's the problem. 
People of the light, people who are followers of Jesus Christ who say we live in the light, we're about truth, we're about honesty, we're morality. We would tout things like honesty and integrity and yet we act in the world in a totally different way. We act in such a way that, that is very similar to people of the world. And so we're not acting shrewdly. We're acting uh, um, I, 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 unaware. We're, we're not aware the power wealth has on our life. Now, Jesus doesn't stop here. He, he starts explaining. He says this, just an interesting statement. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwelling. So what Jesus is doing here, he's got a kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek kind of way of saying it. He says, the way that guy used wealth to get friends so that he would be welcomed here on earth. He says, you use your wealth with eternity in mind. You use your wealth in such a way that you think, you know what? What, what does not matter is the short term, is getting more stuff, is protecting myself, is finding security in this life. But instead, I'm going to have an eternal perspective. So I'm going to ask, what can I do to use this in such a way that is pleasing to the master, helps people, uh, takes care of my responsibilities, but that wealth becomes a tool that I use well because there's an eternal perspective that I want to have here. That when I get to eternal uh, dwellings, I understand that, that so much of what we are called to manage here in life is actually preparation for what we will do and experience in eternity. And so what I really want is I want to be found faithful. I want to spend responsibly. I want to have God's perspective on wealth and how it works. I want to work and spend and live in such a way that I understand that I'm not an owner, but instead I am a steward who will give an account to the master who's going to want us to have been a blessing with the resources we have instead of like most Americans using almost everything we have on ourselves. And, and so this is a challenge for us to think deeply about this. No, it doesn't stop there. Look at this. It says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted, uh, can also be trusted with very much. And so what he's basically saying is that in this life, even if you're just managing a ton of stuff and you're very impressed with that, in the scope of eternity, in the scope of what we are going to be called to do in heaven, because in heaven it says we're going to rule and we're going to reign with Christ. We are being trusted with little. And if we are able to, to be entrusted with that, we have that eternal perspective. Well, then in eternity, the scriptures say we'll be entrusted with great things. We will rule and reign with Christ. And so if we understand this internal perspective that what we do now is preparation in practice that qualifies us for what we will do in eternity. Now, I'm not talking about gaining salvation, but I'm talking about our roles, our callings in heaven. Well, man, it changes dramatically how we look at this. And when we see ourselves as not as owners, and this is preparation, totally changes the way we think about this. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so, so often what we need to understand is that, that in our wealth, there are all kinds of traps. We're going to talk about those in a second. But there's also opportunity. Character can be forged by the person who learns to manage their wealth in a good way, in a healthy way, in a compassionate way, in a generous way, in a way that is obedient to what the master wants. Character is born in that, but there's also a trap. The trap that we can just get backwards on this thing of wealth. Now, take a look at what else Jesus says. He says, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Okay? So again, there's an understanding that what we are doing now, our stewardship on earth, is preparing us and in some respect qualifying us for what we'll be doing in eternity. Verse 12. And if you have been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? He says there is something more significant, something that's eternal, something that really matters. And if you can't get that straight in your head, if you actually think what you have now is what matters, you're just deeply, deeply confused. You won't have it long. It'll be taken away. It will go. No one servant can serve two masters. And this is something that Jesus said all the time because now we looked at the second, first part of stewardship. This is lordship. Because when money becomes what rules you, man, it just becomes horribly unhealthy. Either he will hate one and love the other because you're not going to love God and love stuff. You're not going to be trusting God and trusting stuff. You're not going to be okay with God, but it's okay because I've got everything under control because I just got a big pile of stuff. 
And, 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 and you know what? You're not going to have your identity in Christ, that this is what makes me matter if you think what matters is the house, the car, the 401k, all those kinds of things like that. So, so he says, you will either hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so this passage is about uh, a twisted trail of, of it, it, you know, intrigue and, and an owner and a manager and what they do to survive. And then it's meant to cause us to take a step back and say, okay, where am I at this? Where am I at this conversation with money? Now watch this. The Pharisees, so these are the religious leaders, look at this, who loved money, who loved money. Let, let me just stop can you honestly in your life admit there was a time you've loved money? I mean, you just have loved stuff. You took your delight in it. You, you took shortcuts to get it. I mean, it's what makes you feel okay. It would make you feel important. And, and maybe for you, it's, you know what? Um, I don't have any money, so I can't love money. Sometimes the people who don't have any money at all are the people who love it the most because it becomes, they become jealous. They become covetous. They become entitled. They become angry. Uh, all the different things like that. So, 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 we are always being tempted to make money our God, particularly in this culture. The Pharisees who loved money heard this, and they were sneering at Jesus. Now, again, this parable is a parable where it becomes very easy to sneer at Jesus, to say, Jesus, you understand the way the world works. You don't understand what this is really all about. Jesus, you, we just, just got a real, got a practical. Just make sure that you're not grouping yourself up with this group of people. They heard this and they were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones, look at this, who justify yourselves. Now again, this is why it's so important to take parables like this into the inner place, lay it out on the table and say, okay, Jesus, okay, Holy Spirit, okay, Father, how am I doing on this? What role is money playing? Am I being obedient to give and to tithe? Am I being obedient to care for the poor? Am, am I getting my sense of identity from this? Have I let some important relationship get torn all up in part? And, and I'll say it's because it's not the money, it's the point, it's the principle, but it's the money. At the end of the day, if the money wasn't there, the problem wouldn't be there. And so, so we justify ourselves. You see how insidious this is and how the religious leaders were doing it? The ones who justify themselves in the eyes of men. But God knows the heart. That's why it's so important to go to the inner life where, where, where you can't, I mean, the Holy Spirit is gonna call you out. There's no pretense. There's no identity. There's no, you know, token gestures that look like we've got it all together. But the truth is we just delight in our stuff. We just find our identity. We just feel powerful. We feel like we're in control. All of that is an illusion. All of that is a trap, okay? All right, so eyes of men, but God knows the heart. What, he, what is highly valued among men, what we give attention to, we give awards to, we say, that's what I want, that's status, that's power, that's control, that's enviable, that's what we think we want, okay? He says, is detestable in God's sight. And so again, that's why it's regularly and routinely. We just got to go in everything there and say, Father, how am I doing? Am I living as a steward or am I living as an owner? Are you Lord of this or am I Lord of this? Is my identity in what I have and my stuff or is it in who I am in you? If all the stuff went away and all I had to trust in you, would that be enough? We have to ask these hard questions in the inner life. So, so what I actually want to do is I actually want to, do that right now. So, so I just want to take a minute to kind of go into our inner life, okay? So I'm just going to encourage you, go ahead and just close your eyes for a minute. And, and just imagine um, God the Father as you see him. Just imagine Jesus is there and the person of the Holy Spirit is there as well. And, and just maybe imagine that you're sitting around a table, and nothing is hidden. Everything is known. Everything is exposed. The only person who may be fooled is you, but you don't want to be fooled. So imagine you're sitting there, and open on the table is a Bible, and this parable is, it's open to this parable. And just imagine that, that, that you're going to go honestly, openly, to meet with the Holy Spirit, to meet with the Heavenly Father, to meet with the Lord Jesus. 
And just let's ask our, our souls these questions. It's not important how you would answer it to me. It would be very easy at this point to justify or to sneer. It, it would be very easy to fall back into the trap that is, oh man, the folly of wealth, the anxiety that comes. But let's ask these questions in that inner place. Remembering that God loves you. This is a safe place. Truth sets free. How important is wealth and money to me? How has money impacted my relationships? Has my wealth or the wealth of others created pride, jealousy, embarrassment, shame? How much pleasure comfort and excitement do I get from buying something? When was the last time I gave some time or money or insight to a person who was in need who had no hope of giving me anything in return? When God tells me to give and tithe and sacrifice, am I obedient? How much of my identity is in what I do and how much I make and how I appear and the image that I've created for my wealth? In what ways have I loved money? In what ways have I justified myself? How much time do I spend worried and full of anxiety about the things that I have or the things I wish I had? How have you used my wealth, my power, my position to intimidate, manipulate, or control others? What would Jesus have me change to bring my relationships with wealth in line with his kingdom? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, it is so easy in this age of materialism and commercialism, this age where the world is holding up an image of what it means to be powerful and successful and, and beautiful, to get all backwards on this thing of wealth. Right now, in Jesus' name, we just confess that we've let things slip into our thinking and our attitudes and our perspectives. We confess that we have let things slip into our behaviors that are inconsistent with your kingdom, that are us trying to use wealth in a way that's not of your kingdom. So we would ask that you'd search us, try us, test us. Just help us instead, Father, find true delight in you, that we are called sons and daughters of God, that we have an eternal home, that anything we have here is hay, wood, and stubble. It'll burn up, it'll go, it'll be gone. It'll go to someone else or it'll just go away. That the things of earth are rusting. They are falling apart. They are falling down. They are being taken from us, stolen from us. Father God, we get so worked up about our rights and our, our stuff. Would you free us from that? Would you soften our heart? Protect us from the temptations of the Pharisees to sneer, to self-justify. But instead, for our soul's sake, for your glory, for intimacy with Christ, would you recenter us again? We acknowledge that you are Lord, and anything you ask, the answer must be yes. We acknowledge that you are the owner. Forgive us for the time we act 
like the owner, that it was for and about us, but instead it is for and about you. Give us that heart attitude. Set us free. So easy to become enslaved by what we have, to be owned by what we own. Set us free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A couple next steps this week. Keep going through the parables. Parable a day, use the app, pick up a guide. Um, let God mess with you in the best possible way. Regularly, routinely recenter, like today. Uh, maybe specifically this parable is something you've got to go home, you've got to read. Uh, by the way, if you just keep reading in the rest of Luke, there's several other parables about wealth, about the dangers and the opportunities of wealth. You might just spend some time doing that. A couple more parables there. Join a group. If you're not in a group, how valuable would it be for you if God met you here today, said, you know that message Paul gave this morning? Um, uh, I need to talk about that. What do you guys think? What do you think? I think this. And, and just to coordinate with other people. Maybe you think Paul's out of his mind. What's he talking about? That, that'd be an interesting group too. You could join that group. There's several actually. Um, <laughs> and then um, just, just finally, um, again, be taking time in your inner life. Be taking time to take the word of God with Christ and ask questions. And it's important that we ask questions about the text, that we would come to understand it. But what is so much more important is that we'd ask questions about our soul and our understanding, and our position with God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you love us so much that you don't leave us to our own devices. Set us free from the ensnaring traps of greed, materialism, uh, wealth. Help us instead see them as a tool that we are called to manage as stewards who will give an account. Give us that perspective and the freedom that comes from that perspective. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.